Well, once again, good evening. God bless you. And I give honor to <clears throat> Brother and Sister Betcher. And uh, thank the Lord for them and uh, their pursuit of the kingdom of God. And um, I am very thankful for our acquaintance and friendship and their example of Christianity. Um, I was talking to someone uh, actually on today. Um, they would potentially want me to go out and eat with them. And um, a couple of preachers and I said, I can't. I'm going to be tied up. And um, so we got to talking about uh, what, what I was going to be doing and brother and sister Betcher and the church there. And, um, they were asking questions about all of you. Where's the church? Who's the pastor? You know how preachers can be nosy sometimes. And, uh, but I told him, I said, well, it's one of the greatest churches you'll ever go to. And the Betchers are some of the sweetest people you'll ever want to know. And um, that's that's right. You are, you are as I know you know, very blessed to have Bishop and First Lady Betcher at the helm. And I'm going to tell you something. You can find, you can find people with gifts. They're a dime a dozen. But. One of the greatest identifiers of the people of God in Scripture is that they were first called Christians at Antioch. He, um, that was that was the denotion. That was the big deal. That was where their identification was. They were Christians. <clears throat> and we got a lot of people that want to major in the gifts of the Spirit but they don't know come here from Sikkim about the fruit of the spirit. And um, I'm going to tell you something. This is not where I thought I was going, but while I'm on it, let me just say this. The Lord gave, do you know how many beatitudes there are that are listed? Nine. You know how many fruit of the spirit there are? Nine. You know how many gifts of the Spirit there are? Nine. Now, the Lord knows us. And he knows sometimes we like to get hyper-focused on things. And we are, we are world-renowned for getting out of balance with stuff. <clears throat> so he said, look, I can't, I can't do what I want to do through you unless you're spiritually-minded people. <clears throat> so this is a spiritual kingdom and you're going to be doing spiritual work so here's the nine gifts of the spirit but <clears throat> I don't want you to forget some of these other things and get off balance with just gifts so uh, I'm going to also give you the fruit of the spirit now I'm going to tell you something um a lot of people are more interested in the gifts of the Spirit than they are the fruit of the Spirit. And some of the most spiritually minded people I've known can rattle off every minute detail about the gifts of the Spirit, but couldn't list you three of the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm just going to tell you, you need to be very care careful and cautious about opening your spirit up to somebody who's loaded to the hilt with gifts, but don't have the first stitch of fruit anywhere on, on, the, on the grounds. Gifts can be misused to benefit the individual through whom they're flowing. Fruit, a fruit tree, and I've got me some pear trees and peach trees. If I can keep the birds and the squirrels and the children out of them, uh, we're going to have a go at it. Um, but so far it's two years of it and it's two to nothing. Uh, me coming in at a big fat zero and everything else is 
just laying the waste to my trees. But that don't have anything to do with this. I just thought I'd share it with you and get it out of my spirit so I wouldn't be bitter. <clears throat> but, uh, and the thing is, uh, you never, you can never catch the culprit unless I'm gonna have to put some cameras out just right down on my little trees, find out because nobody's doing it. That's the, that's the brutal thing. Nobody did it. Uh, but I'm going to catch them this year. I've already got a plan. Don't tell anybody, but I got a plan. Anyway, y'all just stop distracting me so I can get on with this. Fruit trees produce fruit. And that fruit does not benefit that tree. That fruit was designed by God to benefit people who came close to that tree or people who gleaned from that tree. <clears throat> the fruit that comes out of a tree is not for the tree. It's for the people that partake of it, everybody else. The fruit of the Spirit in your life, he said, I came that you might have life and that you might have that more abundantly. Now, I'll challenge you with something, probably, possibly, the fruit of the spirit. Now, somebody's going to say, well, that's semantics. Well, just bear with me. The fruit of the spirit, is that plural or singular? What is the fruit of the spirit? I came that you might have life and that you might have that more abundantly. Where does life come from? The vine. I'm the vine, you're the branch. And so <clears throat> these other things, these nine fruits of the spirit, as we call them and as they're lab labeled, <clears throat> are really attributes of his presence in your life. They're really attributes of life from God that's resident in us. Love. Well, who is love? Is it possible? Here's a question for you. Is it possible to love someone if you don't have the Holy Ghost? All in favor say aye. All opposed by the same sign. Oh, somebody almost raised their hand, but they scratched their shoulder. Um, God is love. If God is love and I don't have God, then can I truly love someone? I can do all that humanity is capable of, but truly loving them and them experiencing the true love of God through me is the epitome of love. Love, joy, where else are you going to find joy outside of him? Love, joy, peace, and you start listing all the fruit of the Spirit. Man, I'm telling you something. When you get around someone that's got the Spirit of God living in them, these attributes of that ought to be flowing out of them at all times. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's not just gifts. That's these fruit too. But then the Lord said, now the expression of all of this has got to come from somewhere. So uh, if you're going to be apostolic, you got to know how to behave. You got gifts, you got fruit. Now I'm going to give you some things. Uh, and this is how you administer your gifts and your fruit to the body of Christ and the people around you. The Beatitudes. I'm, I want you to behave correctly. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the pure in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. And you start looking down through there and you're going to find out there, there's a whole lot more to being an apostolic than just slinging gifts all over the room and prophesying uh, I'm going to tell you something somebody without the beatitudes and somebody without the fruit of the spirit will go from prophesying to prophet lying and you got to watch them uh, they're sneaky they'll prophet lie to you son of mighty they'll just spill it right on out there and you'll have a problem fruit gifts and beatitudes the apostolic person is not complete without all of those <clears throat> I would even go so far as to say that it would be hard for me personally to put my confidence in somebody that only wanted gifts and they didn't want fruit and they didn't want the beatitudes. 
the scripture, one of the reasons why is because the scripture talks about a word being fitly spoken. And I am of the conclusion that if I had to physically describe what I think a child of God ought to look like and be like and, and act like, we should be velvet covered bricks. Firm, not going to move, not going to be deceived, not going to compromise truth, yet covered with the love of God so that every touch to me and every contact I have with somebody doesn't leave another wounded carcass in its wake. Velvet covered bricks is what we should be. And that's possible with the gifts of the Spirit and with the fruit of the Spirit and with the Beatitudes. If we've got all of that, then then uh, we can, Paul, Paul talks about uh, praying for the gifts and, and that we should, you know, pursue them. But the greatest of the gifts is the ability, the height of spiritual maturity is when God can love someone through us however he wants to without us arguing with him about it first. My maturity is not complete or my healing is not complete or whatever you want to say if God can't love my worst enemies through me. I can jump up and down on the floor and do cartwheels on the back of those chairs and just flip all the way out in the parking lot to the car. But if God can't love my enemies through me, I am not where I need to be with him. And that has nothing to do with my enemy. That has nothing to do with who's hurt me. That has to do with me. And I'm not going to regress here and go back over last night stuff, but <clears throat> goodness and mercy will follow us. But we've got to put ourselves in a position where it can. I want to read some, a verse of scripture to you here. Uh, I'm going to read one verse, but I'm going to read it three times. And as you might can guess, uh, it'll be in three different translations. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse number 10. <clears throat> and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. <clears throat> that was King James. Now the Amplified Classic Edition. And by unlimited seduction to evil, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they did not welcome the truth, but refused to love it, that they might be saved. And now finally the Passion Translation. And every form of evil deception in order to deceive those <clears throat> who are perishing because they rejected the love of the truth that would lead them to being saved. This verse of scripture got a hold of me some time back, and today it's kind of come back up in my spirit. I want to start now with verse number one. I'm only going to read it in the King James, but I'm just going to read down through 10. So just bear with me. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, that you be not soon shaken in mind, mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us <clears throat> as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now this is talking about uh, the coming of the rapture and, and the Lord coming back for the church. And uh, he said, don't, don't get hoodwinked here and believe everything you hear because that day can't happen until there's first a falling away from the church truth. <clears throat> that means before the rapture, before the end time harvest, 
there is going to be a significant falling away of people who have once served God, who were once faithful to the house of God, loved truth, etc. And all of a sudden, you're going to look around and they are going to be just leaving. 99% of the time, there'll be no reasonable explanation for it either. They're here one week, they're gone the next. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, do you hear that? Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. They will come with power, signs, and wonders, just like the apostolic church is supposed to. The Lord came behind with signs and wonders confirming what had been preached. He's saying to the church, pay attention, because in these last days, there are going to be some treacherous things come. And there are going to be people that are going to come among you and it's going to look right, it's going to sound right, and for goodness sake, it may even feel right. But you better be careful, because something's missing. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they'll believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, I'm, I may get in trouble here in a minute. I'm not 100% sure. But I kind of feel uh, like I may say something that may just get me in hot water with some of you. But you have a right to be wrong. Um, just remember that. <laughs> There was an old country song that I know none of you have ever heard because you've been sanctified since you were yet in the womb. But uh, there was an old country song that was talking about at one point, everything that glitters is not gold. They used to go into these mines with shotguns years ago and they'd, they'd cut the end of a shotgun shell out and they'd dump the pellets out of it and then they would fill it up with gold dust so you've got the charge in it the powder and then it's packed full of gold dust and they'd wax the end of it back up so they would have compression when they shot it and they'd go into these mines that they were wanting to sell these these miners would would buy these claims and may have spent a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars to get this claim and they dig it back into the mountain about 20 feet and there's no gold and they're not going to waste their time on it. So they go in there with those shotguns and they would shoot that rock with that gold dust. And, and they would just, it would just pepper into that rock. Well, then they, they bring in people that were looking to buy a gold mine and they'd show them all this, my Lord, look at this. And they'd sell it for 10 times what they paid for it. And then it didn't take long. That little fella comes in there with his little pickaxe on day one, and he just goes to lay in the thunder and thinks, I'm about to come out of here, son. I'm leaving out of this deal. I'm going to be loaded. And he scrapes that off the walls and comes out realizing uh, I have been bamboozled. Well, by then, that old boy's long gone. You're not getting your money back from him. And <clears throat> he's in a casino somewhere probably. 
Well, that's what's going to happen in the end times, and it's already happened. There are, there are, you, we have to be careful, 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 because the enemy will send people and the enemy will use people that he didn't even send that are more interested in sensationalism than they are spiritualism. They're not, they're not interested in being spiritually minded, but they are interested in being sensational. They're not interested in whether your life has changed or not. They just don't want you to forget their name. And they'll come through and man, they'll, they'll make you think that this is the greatest thing in the wide world. And then when you get to going in that direction, it won't take long before you realize, you know what, I've been deceived. This is not the way of righteousness. This is not the path I'm supposed to be on. Well, by then I may have problems. I, I may have got myself into a bind and, and don't know how to get out of it. And whoever led me astray, uh, they're long gone at this point in time. And those kind of people are dime a dozen. My God, they can come in and preach the tile right out of the ceiling. But when you get through, you feel like you've been splashed around in a mud hole about that deep. It was sensational. Lord, help us, Jesus. We literally wanted to run the aisles, and we did. We just peeled off and ran for Jesus, just hard as we could go, just beating the track around the building. And that's wonderful, and that's all part of it. But that's all it's about. And now they've got us on the hook as part of their fan club. And we're going to give them big offerings, and we're going to buy into everything they do, and they're going to get online. And, and man, they're going to sensationalize their ministry online, and they're going to say to people, uh, you, if you would support our ministry, but they're not going to ask you, uh, before you do any of that, uh, would you go and talk to your pastor first and make sure he's okay with you financially supporting them? That's not what they're going to do. They're just going to start telling you about all the needs they've got and ask you to support their ministry. We've got a GoFundMe page, and we got a PayPal, and we got Venmo, and we got whoever all else. I don't even know. PayPal and Apple Pay, and what in the wide world happened to a cash and a check somebody could write? Who in the world? Venmo. I almost backslid the other night. Somebody was wanting to send me some money for uh, some stuff I had done for them. I said, "Brother, don't don't worry about that." No, I'm I'm. If you're to come, why, brother Shelton? I'm gonna send you. No, I don't want an offer. Yeah, and and now we use Venmo and Zelle. I looked at my wife and I said, "What in the wide world is Venmo and Zelle?" She looked at me and said, you really are 54, aren't you? Yeah, I reckon I am. <laughs> Can you just write a check, put it in the mail to me there, bud? Now, we're going to say all that to you. I like to lost my salvation in the 45 minutes it took me to figure out that through my bank, we had Zell at our bank, and lo, help us, Jesus. <sighs> But that's what they're going to do. They're going to get out there and they're going to say, hey, come support us. Send us a love offering. We got a 5013C, C3 or whatever it is. We we got it. Oh, we can send you a tax receipt at the end of the year. Uh, we're going to get an oil change in our motor home. Anybody want to sew into that? PayPal or something. Go fund me. Go fund yourself. Get a job, for goodness sake. The point I make, I'm sorry. <laughs> Brother uh, Betcher, you might want to just go ahead and pull the old plug here on the old technology. I feel like I've just gone completely off the end of the runway on tonight. I don't know what in the wide world's happened. I'm feeling my oats. But <clears throat> they're not going to tell you, now look, uh, before we will accept any financial support from you, uh, if you would send us an email or something from your pastor saying that he's okay with that. Oh, no. They don't care whether you're paying tithes at home or not. They don't care whether you're being faithful to your man of God or not. They're just going to salt the mind and come in and razzle-dazzle and say, now, if you want to support our ministry, 
And I'm all about sowing seed into the kingdom, for goodness sake. But there's a right and a wrong way to do it. And when you've got nine gifts and you don't have nine fruit and you don't have nine beatitudes, you can run into some stuff and get in trouble out here and the enemy will start making you think this is all about you. And then it becomes about performance. And so Paul was telling the church at Thessalonica, be careful about this because before before the Antichrist gets here and the son of perdition shows up and before all of this stuff happens, there's going to be a great falling away. Okay, and, and I've heard this preached my whole life. There's going to be a great falling away. What are they going to fall away from and what are they going to fall towards? You don't just fall. You fall from or off of something and you fall to or on to something else. A great falling away. Well, men are going to have itching ears. Okay, that's going to be a part of it. And the scripture says that in the last days, men are going to become lovers of them own selves more than lovers of God, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Well, that's not talking about the lost. That's not talking about people that have never been in the kingdom. He's saying they're going to become lovers of them own, their own selves. Their, their loyalties and their love is going to shift and transfer. When You can't say that verses about those who have never known God because they already love something besides him. He's talking about a transformation in the life of a believer. There's going to come a point in, in the seasons of the church where people who have once loved God are going to begun, begin to love the lust of the eye and the pride of life and the lust of the flesh. And they're going to want what they want more than what God wants for them. And, and he said, you're going to have to be careful because he's going to, the enemy's going to allow people to come among us and seduce us with signs and wonders and miracles. But that don't mean that we abandon signs, wonders, and miracles, but you got to know the vessel that's coming out of. <clears throat> now, for instance, I knew a lady who went to a healing crusade, and the brother that was there, why, he was quite renowned. And had quite the reputation. Well, he done called his sister out. Sister right over there, stand up. On my left, third row back from the front, stand up. She stood up. He said, lift your hands. God's ready to heal that earache in your right ear. She just looked at him. He said, sister, lift your hands. She lifted them. Now, God's ready to heal that earache in your right ear. Are you ready for that? She just looked at him, kind of shook her head. He said, are you telling me you don't want God to heal that earache in your right ear? She said, no, I'm telling you I don't have an earache in my right ear. He said, you know what? I'm looking at you. You're right. It's your left ear. I, I was thinking right, but it's actually your left is on my right, so that's now God's going to heal that. Are you ready for that? And she just shook her head at him. He said, what is it now? She said, I don't have an earache in my left ear either. Now it's going on in front of 250 people. He said, you know what? The enemy's trying to confuse me. There's a fog between us and he's trying to confuse what God's trying to do. And because he knows all that the Lord's going to do in here, he said, you've had chronic earaches in both your right and left ear since you were a child and God's ready to heal you so that you'll never again have a chronic earache. Lift your hands right now and receive it. And she just stood there. Well, he was frustrated because he wanted her to lift her little hands so he'd go on and pray and move on. She didn't, she didn't even unfold her arms. And he said, are you not going to lift your hands? Do you not want to? He's turning it on her now. Are you not wanting your healing? It is as quiet as a mausoleum in there. And she looked at him and told him, uh, sir, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never had an earache one time in my entire life. I've never had one earache at all. He said, I've got it now. The Lord's trying to put a hedge of protection around you because the enemy's getting ready to start attacking you with earaches. 
have you lost your mind? I, whew, how in the wide world are people going to fall away because of that kind of stuff right there? I, 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 one night I couldn't sleep and, um, I just felt led to get online. The Lord directed me and I pulled up this guy that I know. I don't know how I know him. I don't know why I know him. Maybe it's for this season, but somehow or another, he, he got to call me a few years ago and He's trying to get his healing ministry up and running. And um, he was online and he's in a whole nother country somewhere in the world. And he's, he's my Lord, it was like, uh, I need to just go to my seat. I don't, I don't, I feel my pressure's going up. I've never, I've never witnessed such a mess in my entire life. People were getting online with him, and it's not many, but just a few. But he'd say, "Okay, now let me see who I'm going to minister to." Well, he, brother Betcher, he got. Well, now, okay, sister, uh, you. I'm seeing right down into your kidneys right now, and you've got a, well, hey, I believe in all that. But she's typing back to him, telling him, no, sir, I don't have any problems. You're not having pain in your kidneys? No. Okay, you know what? Let me see. Okay, because we're online and all, uh, you know what? It's actually, oh, sweet God. So I texted him while he was right there on the line. I figured if I had to be up, he needed to be interrupted. And I just texted him. I said, you know what? God's never missed it. Not one time. God don't miss it. And if God is ministering to these people, he's not going to have to guess until he, you know, the process of elimination. He's, he's going to nail this thing right off the bat. Quit guessing and confusing the people of God. So he got offline and called me. I'm not trying to be a know-it-all, but don't tell me you want my help and, and not expect to get it. Number two, uh, I know a whole lot of people that have credible ministries that don't need some knucklehead muddy in the water so that people are skeptical of spiritual ministry when the real thing does show up. We don't have time to sit in the pew and try to figure out, okay, is this guy for real or is he not? First of all, in your church, you've got the blessing of having a godly man and woman leading you that, that have enough sense to know, uh, come here from Sikkim and the real thing from false and a fraud, and they're not going to bring a fraud in there among you. So if they walk in your church, you're protected. You, you've got... And if they did go off the wall and do something ridiculous, I guarantee you the bishop would get up and shut them down. He might be real sweet about it, but at first, if they resisted him, he might drop kick them, but he would stop what they were doing. He wouldn't put up with that. He's not going to subject you to that. But if you leave there and you go to church somewhere else, let's say you're on vacation and you go to church, whatever town, because apostolic people do that, you know, you go to church on vacation. And so, they, let's say you're on vacation or you're out of town on, on work and uh, you go to church somewhere. You need to have enough discernment to know if what's coming down the pipe is legitimately from God or if it's somebody trying to be a deceiver and salt the mind so that they'll get you to buy into what they're doing and buy their books on the way out the back door. What are they going to fall away from? Truth. What are they going to fall away to? A lie. How are they going to fall away? 
through deception. Where does the love for the truth come from? He said they received not a love for the truth. That means that somebody had to try to give them a love for the truth. The only way you can refuse to receive something is if somebody's standing in front of you trying to give it to. If you're trying to give me something, I can, I can refuse to receive that. But I can't refuse to receive something if you're not standing there trying to give me something. So somewhere along the way, God, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He tried to give them a revelation of who he was, what the truth was, what the doctrine was, what the kingdom was, who the bride is, who you are as a child of God individually and collectively the bride. Somewhere along the way, God tried everything he could to give them a love for the truth. You don't go out and just cultivate that on your own. We don't just wake up one day and decide, hey, you know what, I think I'll love truth today. There's, there's got to be some impartation. There's got to be something there that says, you know what, I want to love truth more than I want to be comfortable. I want truth preaching more than I want convenient preaching. Bishop, if you got to lay the thunder to me three times a week, five times a week, or seven days a week, for God's sake, love my soul enough not to let me go to hell. But you got to watch them guys that are always wanting to prophesy money out of your pocket into theirs. They always, you know, I, I need to just, I wish you'd pull the plug and let me go. My pressure's coming up and I need to get on back to what I'm, I feel like I want to be talking about. But you, we've got to love truth not personalities. And for a long time, what God's been trying to do in the church, he's had, to, he's had to use the personalities that we like the most. That has to stop. That nonsense has, I don't care if it's some one-tooth redneck that comes out of the woods once a year wearing bib overalls and red wing work boots with no socks and hadn't brushed his one tooth in a week. But if he's got a word from God, we better be willing to receive that. And it doesn't have to be some Louis Vuitton carrying guy that comes in with his iPad and a Louis Vuitton case and can speak just with the greatest eloquence you've ever heard. The end time revival is not going to be personality driven. We're done with that. It is not going to be on the backs and the shoulders of personality. <clears throat> God's not going to let it be. It's going to be on truth and truth alone. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If I was the devil, I'd be doing everything I could to, to confuse the people of God about what the truth really is. For instance, what do you think is most important? This is really what I felt like I wanted to talk about, but what do I know? What do you think is most important to God? Numeric growth in the church. Everybody believes that's important. Hold your hand up. For God's sake, we got to win the lost. Do y'all not want that building full? For goodness sake. Everybody believes God wants the building full. Hold your hand up. It's not a trick question, except it might be. It is important to him that the building's full. But how it gets full is more important to him. How we fill the building up is really what's important. I'm not going to pay you to come to church. We might have a door prize sometime along the way. We might we might have a drawing and give away a, I don't know, a Harley Davidson or something. My goodness. We, we just, you can't ever tell what we'll do. We may just go out and buy your old car and just raffle that bad boy right on off. Who knows? But we're not going to try to seduce you into being a member of our church just so we can have warm bodies on the pew, except we do that. Our church growth has become, our efforts for church growth have become about how many people we can say we have in our church rather than how many souls have actually been added to the kingdom. <clears throat> we're interested in filling every chair in the building up, and I'm all for that because Every full chair that's filled with somebody that's been born again 
That's one more soul that's not going to go to hell. And I give God thanks for that. But do you think God is more interested in a full building or a full relationship? If you think relationships more important to God than numeric growth, hold your hand up, wave it. You're 100% correct. You can have numeric growth and no relationship. I remember met with this couple years ago and man, when they were dating, whoo, were they dating? Lord, help us, Jesus. They loved each other so much. They'd stay on the phone all hours of the night talking. Brother, go to work and just be bloodshot eyes. And she nearly flunked in college. She, she used to tire. She didn't even know, come here from Sikkim. She didn't know what they were doing in the great college classrooms. It's like, y'all going to have to go to bed at night somewhere along the way here. This laying up and talking all night. He'd drive hours to get to where she was at and talk to her. And, oh, they were in love. You could have written a song about how much they loved one another. It was wonderful. Then they got married and whoo, it was a utopian paradise. My Lord, help us. They'd walk into a room and, and birds and angels just chirped and sang together. It was wonderful. Seemed like a heavenly floodlight just shined on them everywhere they went. Oh, it was spectacular. What an example of love. Well, then she got pregnant. And then she had a baby. Then they were in the office. There was no utopian paradise. No, no. We were out in a great wilderness at this point. We had left utopia. Well, no floodlight shining down from heaven. It's just a low-hanging, gray, nasty, misty haze and cloud everywhere. I sat there listening to them talk and, well, what's the problem? She's over there holding a the baby, just bouncing the little baby. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And he's sitting over there just glaring at them. And she's trying to tell me, I just, you know, we just, and then she's burping the little brother and just, oh, it was wonderful. Smell baby powder everywhere. No dad over here. He just glaring at them. And just right out, I mean, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I looked at him. I told her, I said, if you could stop all that just a minute. I pointed at him. I said, you're jealous of that baby, aren't you? And he looked at me, and he got the most messed up look on his face. Is that old ugly, ugly crying stuff. You know, we was talking about it last night. Just, oh, it was, it was wretched. The tears just started running. He said, yes, sir, I am. I said, how in the wide world are you jealous of a three-month-old baby? And he said two things to me that just really stunned me because of the correlation. He said, because, Brother Shelton, I used to be the center of her world. I used to be the focus of her attention. All of the love you see her giving that child, I'm glad she loves our son. But she used to have time for me. Now she don't. And I don't have the same connection with that child that she does because I work all the time. I've got a hundred other things I'm doing. She's home with the baby. And when I get home, she's exhausted. And all she wants to do is let me hold the baby while she goes and gets a hot shower. And then I look up and she's in the bed asleep. And I'm in here changing dirty diapers and still in my work clothes. I said, well, you did know that was going to be the case. I mean, it's been, believe it or not, that's been going on for centuries. He said, yeah, I know. But can you believe that she's already talking to me about having a second one? And she's telling me that she wants four or five. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and he said, you treat me just like that. 
all you want me for is babies. You want me to fill your churches up so you can brag about it, show everybody how many you're running. There was a time I was the center of your attention. There was a time that all you wanted was me. But now all I ever hear from you is baby, 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 baby. Give us babies, give us babies, give us babies. He said Calvary was not for babies. Calvary was for relationship. Relationship is what produces babies. And you're wanting me to give you babies without relationship. And I'm not going to do it. And since you can't get me to give you babies without a relationship, you've decided to just go adopt or foster all the kids you can get your hands on. Rather than work on this between me and you, you'll just go adopt a child here and adopt a child there and foster them there. He said, so you, you don't want relationship. So you develop church growth processes and systems rather than relationship. You do attendance drives because it satisfies your need for children without having to commit to a relationship. Brother Betra, I began to ask him, why is it so hard for us to commit to relationship? He said, because there can't be two wheels running the show. And I'm not going to relinquish mine for yours. And if you're going to be in a happy relationship with someone, somebody in that relationship is going to have to digress and acquiesce to the other. And he's not going to. When you pray, pray after this wise. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not mine, his. So for there to be a relationship between me and him, I cannot have my will involved at all. If I do, the relationship becomes an argument or a tug of war or a battle or a struggle for dominance. And it's not him struggling with us. It's us once again kicking against him. Well, Brother Shelton, how do we grow our churches? The greatest church growth equation ever given to the church is in the Bible. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Not just at church, but on our jobs. When all hell has broke loose and every demonic spirit in the county is sitting on your desk trying to make you have a nervous breakdown, and you just begin to quietly start, Lord, I thank you. Lord, you're so good to me. And a coworker walks by, and maybe they know what you're going through. And they say to you, how in the world can you have that kind of an attitude, especially toward God, when you're going through what you're going through? And right then and there, you're lifting God up. And, and whether you think, oh, well, they're just asking. No, they're not just asking the question. They're being drawn to him through your exaltation of him. So here I am in the middle of a store. I'm walking through the store. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you've been so good to me today. I'm draw, I'm lifting him up. And all of a sudden, somebody in that store may walk over to me and say, did I hear you praying? Matter of fact, you did. Well, Brother Shelton, they're just asking. No, they're not. It's the kingdom's formula for growth at work. Lift me up. I'll draw them to you. You don't have to worry about that. I'll draw them in. Wednesday night, in, I, somehow or another, I'm, I'm still got the hyphen class here. When, and so I'm usually home on Wednesday nights and, and I like to be home on Wednesdays. And, uh, and so I've, I got, uh, somehow, uh, I'm still in that hyphen class and I, it's, boy, we're having a blast. I looked up Wednesday night, brother Betcher, and there were seven first time guests walked in that room, uh, hyphen age, they right from the college and, and several of them were, um, there and they have no idea why they're there. They don't know anybody in that church. They have no clue what's going on. They just felt compelled to come in. They saw people their age going down a certain hallway in a certain building. And, and somebody said, Hey, are you looking for the hyphen class? Yeah, I guess so. Well, here, let me take you to it. And the Holy ghost moves in there. Listen, all I can tell you is when you start putting God where he said to be put, 
and we magnify him and we lift him up and we exalt him. Well, where do we put him? As the first priority in my life. It's about relationship. It's not performance. It's not how good do we preach. It's not how good are our systems. It's not how good is our evangelism ministry. It's about have I lifted God up? Have I exalted him? Have I magnified him? Am I leaning on him for everything? In all thy ways acknowledge God, and he'll direct thy, your path. It, it, am I doing all of that? The enemy is trying to get you and I to look apostolic, sing apostolic, feel apostolic, but, but somehow or another go around the relationship. Because without a relationship with God, who is God? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you'll spend time with him, he'll give you a love for him. But to get that, we got to get some other stuff out of our life. There's no room for him and them. So I got to get that stuff out so there's only him. And when that relationship with truth then comes, remember, it's not just a relationship with quote unquote God. It's a relationship with all that he is. Love, joy, peace. He's all of those things. He's the lily of the valley. He's the Alpha and the Omega. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. That's what the enemy is trying to get you and I to the place we don't have a relationship with. Now, I'm going to touch a golden calf right quick, and then I'm going to go to my seat. I don't know what everybody's take on this business at Asbury College is. I don't know. And I'm not asking, I feel compelled to say this. If that's God, and if that's the Lord moving in that situation, I give thanks and high praise and high honor for what he's doing, number one. So don't be sending me no hate mail talking about, oh, Brother Shelton, because I'm not going to read it. Number two, I am thankful for what appears to be, and from Arkansas to Kentucky, all I've got is news news stories and articles. So, and the occasional video that somebody sends me. But what seems to be legitimate true hunger, that people are hungry for something, looking for something. I give God high praise and high honor for that. And I honor those young people that are, and for the record, so you'll know, yes, there are some looky-loos down there that don't, they, they're no more interested in what's going on there than a man in the moon. They just, what went you out to see, a reed shaking in the wind? they just looking. But at the core of all of that, somewhere in the mix of all of the media that's there now and the global attention that it's attracted, just like at Azusa Street, there was a man with his head in a shoebox with all the fanfare and the news articles going on you didn't find Seymour there. William J. Seymour was somewhere with his face in a box praying for a move of the Holy Ghost. So somewhere at the core of all of this, there's somebody that was and apparently still is praying for there to be an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Maybe it's a grandma in Wisconsin who prayed for their daughter, their son, their granddaughter to, to, to come back to God. I don't know where it started. I don't know how it started. But apparently something is going on. Now, that being said, you're in Chicago. I'm in Arkansas. None of us are in Asbury. And what's happening there is wonderful. And if it's God and the ones that are hungry for him, they will find someone to preach to them the word of God. And if it's God, he will see to it that somebody goes to them with the truth to preach to them. Well, how do you know that? Well, there was one eunuch in the chariot out in the woods somewhere. Not a university full of people. One man had some scripts in his hand that he was reading. And because he was hungry, the Lord sent someone to talk to him. 
There's no way in the world that that college is full of people looking for God and God's not going to send someone to them. All right? God will try his best to send someone to them and, and probably already has. I know some apostolic guys that have actually already been there. But the point I'm making to you is it is easy for we apostolic people to get caught up in the emotion and the excitement of what's going on in Kentucky and forget our own altars at home. Don't let yourself be so, don't let a godly situation become a distraction to you. You're not at Asbury College. We're in Chicago. And we cannot neglect what God's trying to do right in front of us and start criticizing what's not happening at your church. What's happening there had to happen there. If it was necessary for that to happen where you are and where I am, it would. Because he is desperate for us all to go somewhere we've never gone before in him. But don't compare apples to oranges. I feel like I've lost some of you here and you just fell off the wagon. Stay with me. Let's thank God for the hunger that are seeking him. Let's thank God for open doors to minister to people. Let's thank God for all the supernatural stuff that's going on in Kentucky and Florida and wherever all else is going on. But don't get caught up in the entrapped thoughts that I've got to reproduce Asbury here. I've got to replicate what's happening there, here. No, that's necessary for there. But God's got something else to do here. God, God's not just going to do something there and forget Bartlett, Illinois. There's something major and supernatural that God's been setting you up for for a very long time. And you cannot let anything get between you and the vine, you and the truth, you and, and, and what's right and what's righteous. You can't, not even a good report. I have seen people, Brother Betcher, lose their way with God because they looked at what their church was doing and looked at what somebody else's was doing. And this church they were in was more of a plotting, battling church that was just tearing down the gates of hell. And that bunch over there was just running, running marathons all the time. And this person, I've, had, I've seen it happen a lot of times. And this person says, you know what, our church just, this just, we don't have what they've got over there. Well, hey, Sparky, they wouldn't have that over there if your church wasn't doing what it's doing. Somebody's got to go to war. Somebody's got to do battle with the adversary. So whatever God's called you to do and be in Bartlett, Illinois, be that with everything you've got and fall in love with the truth. And don't let somebody come through and do or say anything that drives a wedge between you and the truth. Relationship is what's important. I see somebody else in love. Oh, it's so wonderful. You see some couple come along and oh, they holding hands and ooh, that's beautiful. But me and Precious are not going to sit and look at them across the restaurant, taking notes on our phone and say, you know what? I want to wear a shirt just like that. I believe if I wore that shirt, you'd look at me different. Mmm, you see how she's got her hair all dolled up? I believe if you do that, whoo, you'll have my full attention. Uh -uh. I'm not comparing what me and Preston's got to what they're doing. No, I'm happy right where I'm at, and we got a good thing going on here, and we're just going to keep right on moving just like we have been. Don't get distracted with what's going on anywhere else in the world and anywhere else in anybody else's church. You fall so in love with the truth. The Lord will lead and guide you into everything he wants you doing as a church. And I'm going to my seat, but I am going to tell you something. God did not call you as a church to be just like everybody else. He did not call you as a church to be just like anybody else. He has called that church to be unique and different. Not easily razzled, not easily dazzled, not easily deceived, because there is a bedrock of truth that has been the foundation 
of what that church has been built on since day one. You hear me? And God is going to use you, you folks to be the tip of the spear. He is already doing things in the greater Chicago area because of what you're doing right there in that building and in, in groups and prayer meetings and whatever all you've got going on. The Lord's given the bishop a vision about how to extend the kingdom and the rings and all of the things. And if you've never heard it or him talk to you about it, you ought to go sit down and let him tell you what God's given him. To grow the kingdom, to expand the kingdom, to send out ministries, to do various things. Not for the not for the advancement of a person, not for the advancement of a personality, but to have multiple people leading on multiple fronts with one spirit of ministry so that that region is, is shaken by revival and the back of that spirit up there is completely shattered and destroyed and the enemy is bound so that revival can come to an entire region, not just to one place, not just to 10 daughter works or 50 daughter works or 100 daughter works, but to an entire region because of what God's called you to do in Bartlett, Illinois. God has given you a mandate and a mission that probably is not the same as any other church in Northern Illinois. And we're not going to compare ourselves among ourselves. Love the truth. Buy the truth. Don't sell it. Don't let somebody come along and talk you in to walking away from what God has given you. For nothing at all now brother Betra, I feel like I've been all over the map but relationship at the end of the day is what's most important to him not what I say to you not what any other guy that comes through there from time to time will say to you God gave you a bishop that loves truth, loves the word, and is not going to get out of that book. He's going to stay in that book, and he's going to follow that book, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. He's going to do it. But you can't just say, okay, Brother Betcher, you know, lead me. I've got to love that book, too. I've got to love the word of God, too. I've got to love my relationship with him too. I can't just let him have the relationship and expect that to be my relationship. I got to have one with the Lord too. <clears throat> the Lord's going to clean this house out. He's going to clean it out. And I'm going to tell you something. You'll be safe if you're involved in a relationship with him. Not long ago, my wife and I, which it, we, we are more than thankful for it, but, and we love it, you know, but from time to time, there's liable to be 20 preachers and their wives uh, descend upon our house and it'll last for two or three days sometimes. Now, if I got tired of all the riffraff and the noise and I started purging my house, do you know who's not gonna get put out? my wife and kids, everybody else going to have to go. She's not going to have to go because me and her guys, we got a relationship. She's my bride. He is going to clean his house out. There is going to be a great falling away. We read it in Thessalonians. He has allowed deceivers to come among us. There are going to be plenty of reasons why people are going to walk away from the truth. But the only ones that won't walk away from truth are the ones that have a relationship with the truth, which is him. Thank God for the blessings that are going on and all of the wonderful things that are happening in every other part of the world, not just Kentucky. But Lord, I don't want to get so caught up with everybody else and what they've got that I, I let what you and I have fall to the ground and die. 
I don't want to fall out of love with him and in love with something else. Does that make sense to y'all? Relationship is where it's all at. Why don't you stand with me for a minute and get the kinks out before I go into phase two? Phase two is I'm going to get out of the way and let Brother Fetcher have it. Every once in a while, my wife and I will go through our budget, and our personal finances, and we get we get the lint out, is what we call it. But you, you realize at that point that a lot of things have accumulated in your budget that you didn't know were there. And, um, you know, now they've got these apps that will go through, and if you've signed up for memberships or magazines or whatever it'll go through and cut them off for you lord have mercy if if you got to have an app go through and do all that for you you don't need a phone uh, you're grounded you can't you got to go get a flip phone you done signed up for some junk but from time to time it is positive for us to turn every other distraction off and make the focus of our attention looking to see if something else has gotten in the end of this relationship between me and him. Have I allowed my job? Have I allowed my family? Have I allowed my health? Have I allowed finances? Have I, whatever it is, in my case, have I allowed the ministry to become more important than the relationship? And every now and then, and it's, I don't know that there's a specific amount of months between which times you do this. But when I start feeling that that relationship is suffering some and it's not what it was, I will, I will get myself alone with him and begin to go through my life and ask the Lord, show me what is it that's getting between us. And <clears throat> when I find it, I get rid of it. I got to declutter it all, get it out of there because relationship is more important than all the things that I might do in ministry. It wouldn't matter if I, man, if I preached to every person in the world and never prayed and spent time with the Lord one more time. I preached the word. I read the word. I preached the word. I taught it and prayed three and a half billion people through to the Holy Ghost. But I never spent time with him. I'm probably going to end up lost because anybody could have prayed those three and a half billion people through, but I alone can have a relationship with him for me. My wife does not have uh, a tracking device on me. She don't worry about me when I'm gone. I don't worry about her when I'm gone. Well, yeah, y'all trust each other and that's part of it, but you know why we trust each other? because we know what our relationship with each other is. I can't breathe without her. I, I leave this house going on a trip, my hand to God. Uh, I'm either going to cry on my way out the door, my way out of the driveway, or at some point in time when I get to the hotel that night and there's nobody there but me, I'll be crying. Because I miss her. I tell the Lord, if you've got to take one of us first, take me. Because I can't survive without her. I don't want to survive without her. I, I can't even bear the thought of it. I'm hers 100%, completely and totally. Whatever I can do to make her life better, that's what I'm going to do. And she's the same way to me. So there's a relationship there that supersedes all else. Our kids are better off because we've got a good relationship. Our home is better off because we've got a good relationship. Everything's better with a good godly relationship. And as babies come in those back doors back there and you look around and that church is filling up week after week after week, the best way to make sure that they're going to stay in the body and be healthy and mature is if mama, you, the bride, and the husband have a good solid relationship.
I hope that I have not bored your heads off. I hope I have not just wore you smooth out in the last hour and whatever. <clears throat> but I'm telling you, your relationship with God is more important than anything you could ever do for God. Relationship. Lift your hands right now. I'm going to pray. For the better, I'm, I'm done. When you're ready, you just take it. Lord, I pray right now that whatever whatever has to happen, condition us so that we can receive a love for the truth. Lord, tonight, I really believe you're in that room right now and you're doing everything you can to give us a love for the truth. I know that we, I'm not saying nobody in the room loves the truth, but I, I'm saying there's something deeper going on here and you're trying to prepare us for the things and the times to come. You've called this church. You have given them a specific, powerful mandate from heaven. You have given them a responsibility to the kingdom and to that region, and they are going to do it. But it's going to be done because of the truth. It's not going to be because of our might and our power, but it's going to be done by you. Help us to love the truth and be submitted to the truth. Above all things, the love for the truth and then submitted to the truth so that your will and your will alone. Come on, I, I want y'all to just spend a few minutes and, and ask the Lord, Is there have I let stuff get in my life that's crowding out my relationship with you? Take a minute. You, you, you pray for yourselves right now. I can't do it for you. You pray and ask the Lord, show me. I'm open, God, I'm honest. If there's something here that should not be here, Reveal it to me and I'll get it out of the way so that our relationship does not suffer. Brother Betcher. Let's keep praying. Let's keep praying. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Feel free to come up. Feel free to come up and pray. Oh, Jesus. Uh, how's your relationship with him? Other things fall apart. We give all of our attention upon that. We've got to give our attention to the relationship. Don't stop praying. <clears throat> Pray more. Oh, Jesus. 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 You remember David said, Restore unto me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He did not say, restore my salvation. He said, restore unto me the joy of my relationship, my salvation with you. Are you still happy about it? Are you still filled with joy because of your relationship with him? Or has it become mundane? Has it become, has it become a task? Has it become a drudgery? Has it become a bunch of conflicts that you continue to work out? Or has the joy come back in? Are you happy to be connected to him? Let's pray that tonight, Lord. Restore the joy. <coughs> Restore my joy. Lord, I've let many voices come and begin tearing things apart. God, voices you said there are many voices. God, I want your voice to be the strongest voice in my life. And I want my relationship with you. Lord, you said seek ye first. You didn't say seek the family and then me. You said seek me first and all these things shall be added. Let my relationship with you be the utmost important. Let it be the most high priority in my life, God, right now. God interacting with you, talking to you and you talking to me. God, there's conflicts, there's mountains that need to be moved. But Lord, give me the authority and the confidence in my prayer with you to do so. God, things have crept in into our, quote, budget, God. God, things have gotten in my way. And Brother Shelton even said his ministry sometimes it can get in the way of his relationship with God. That doesn't even make sense to me. But it's possible that we seek a ministry more than we seek him. God, that's your relationship. That's it. Reach for him. 
I sense all sorts of conflict right now. What you need to do is focus on Him. We continue to go to Him with a laundry list of problems. Lord, my job, my marriage, my kids, addictions. You go down the whole list and then you go home and He said, wait a minute, what about me? What about my relationship? I miss my time with you. I miss my interaction with you. I don't want to be a spiritual Santa Claus that just takes care of problems. I, want, I made you to interact with you. I made Adam to interact with him. And now I made you to interact with you. Lord. Lord. Oh, that's it. Open the heart. Open the doors of the heart up right now. God, let it be about you. Come on, remember the first time you felt his presence. The tears began to come. You stood in awe of his presence. You stood in awe of his majesty. Let's work our way back to that through all of the clutter, through all of the turmoil. God, let us make our way back to you. Jesus. Jesus, you know exactly where I am. You know the things that are on my plate right now, the things that I'm dealing with. That's it, Lord. That's it, Lord. Come on, the Lord just told me the problem is that we trust our own ability instead of His. We'll get to you, Lord, once we take care of our problems. God says, get to me and I'll take care of your problems. Come on, we trust our own ability to unravel the spaghetti problems in our lives. And He said, you're not trusting me. You're spending all of your energy and all of your ability trying to figure it out yourself. And he said, didn't he say, cast your cares upon me, for he careth for you? Give it to him. Let him work it out. Stop figuring it out. God, let me focus on my relationship with you. Come on, give him a chance. Give him a chance. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, for taking the authority away from you. Lord, for taking control. God, give me the ability to trust you. I used to. Help me trust you, God. Help me trust you, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. God, I trust you. I trust you, God. I trust you, God. I trust you, God. Hallelujah. 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 I trust you, God. I trust you, God. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. <coughs> Hallelujah. Oh, that's it. He said you want the blessing without the relationship. God, we get excited about moves of your spirit. 
we get excited about you, God. You even said, are you here for the loaves and the fishes? Or are you here for relationship? The multitudes followed him. The loaves and the fishes, the healings, the miracles. What he really wanted was a relationship with them. God. Come on, repentance is always in line. And then worship. Worship puts him back on the throne. It's so important. I've heard people say, I don't need the worship. I just need the word. See, the word is for us. The worship is for him. Worship puts him back on the throne. Jesus. Lord, if I've done something against you, I pray for your forgiveness. God, I want to be clear with you. I want the road between you and me, God, to be cleared off. But Lord, I want to worship you. Come on, can we begin to worship? If you've apologized, if you've, if you've re repented, really repented. Repentance doesn't mean an apology. Repentance means turning around. It means you're headed in a different direction. An apology just says, please don't, please don't judge me for what I did. Repentance says, I'm turning around. I'm going to do some, some things differently now. God, I'm going to do it because you like it. I'm going to do it because it pleases you. I'm going to do it because it increases my relationship. It deepens my relationship with you. Hallelujah. I said, draw close. If you draw close to him, he'll draw close to you. Will you let him? Will you let him? Let's spend a little bit reaching for him this tonight.